Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends, to the BJJ Brick Podcast. This week on the show, we have Elliot Marshall. Elliot's a uh, New Jersey native. He's a black belt. Uh, we appreciate him taking time to come on the show. I'm here with my good buddy, Gary Hall. Gary, how are you doing today? I am doing great. How about you, Joe? I'm, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. It's just the two of us today. It should probably be the uh, best show ever uh, without Byron around. It should be. In fact, we should hit the video cameras and, and go Facebook Live or something and, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, you know, the two good-looking ones of the show. Well, the good thing is Byron would actually be able to watch it from the hospital bed if we went Facebook Live. That's right. For our viewers that uh, may be interested, uh, Byron's not here today. He's going, undergoing a minor medical treatment. It's uh, He'll be under just local anesthesia. So actually, he's going to be texting in a little bit and let us know what's going on. But uh, about 10 weeks ago, Byron thought he had a... Um, a pimple on his chest or an ingrown hair and, and the little uh, bump just kept getting a little bigger and then it looked like it was bruised around the outside like it had a, a brown circle around it and it turns out that uh, late in life he developed a third nipple uh, and I was doing some research because it made me interested it's actually referred to as a supernumerary nipple because oftentimes there's more than three anyway uh, Byron's going in to Is have he- to does he have any other ones that we don't know about? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> y- you know him better than me. I was going to ask you if you knew. Yeah. Well, I, w- I know he has webbed feet. Does that have anything <laughs> to do with the, the third nipple? It might. Um, I, I do know it said uh, that you don't necessarily need to remove them unless you're experiencing complications uh, like pain from uh, lactating. So I don't know, Gary, if he mentioned anything to you. Uh, but apparently- The thing is... I- I noticed he, his bones are really strong, so maybe he has been drinking a lot of milk. <laughs> anyway, uh, thoughts and prayers to Byron, and uh, we'll see what he has to say when he texts in a little bit later and lets us know how it's going. Yeah, and speaking of Byron, check out his audio book, uh, Six Games for BJJ. And this is a, uh, uh audio book for a little bit higher level, you know, blue belt or above. And Byron's got his uh, other audio book, uh, Your First Year in BJJ, and that's for the white belts. But really, anybody can, you know, get benefit from this uh, this audio book. And Joe and I, we've used it numerous times. We we both have our favorites, and and my, you know, mine is I like to uh, start passing to the other side, start doing my my kimuras on my bad arm or on my opponent's bad arm, I guess, bad side. And um, you know, something that's really helped my game. Um, check it out. We have a link to it in the show notes. It gets great reviews and. Uh, Actually, get it for your teammates, too. A great uh, gift for uh, your jiu-jitsu friends. Yep. Yeah, a really great book. It's a really great concept, too. Uh, after listening to the book, I was uh, inspired to kind of just think of other ways that I could sort of handicap myself. And, yeah, it forces you to get outside the box a little bit, and your game will grow. So definitely check it out. Um, yeah, so... For an off the mat lesson this week, Gary, I thought I'd try something a little different. You what game? you got there, Joe? Yeah, I'm game. Okay, so oftentimes our life lessons they come from our own life experiences, or maybe from uh, something that we've watched somebody else uh, go through, or or something they've experienced. Uh, this one comes from literature. Have you ever thought about the three little pigs, Gary? I haven't really thought about them. I've I've read the book, but, you know, I was young and didn't really think about it. But, yeah, I I can't say I have, Joe. Okay, yeah, you know, kind of like what was going on in their lives before their encounter with the big bad wolf and, you know, what was going on behind the scenes as they were building their houses. And I, I have to think to myself that when the first little pig was building his house out of straw, that there had to be somebody that said, hey, you know, there's a big bad wolf in the neighborhood, and I'm not sure that a straw house is going to offer you the protection that you need. And the little pig probably said, you know, hey, I've built straw houses before. I'm a pretty good builder. And, you know, there's some places in the world where uh, that's all little pigs live in is straw houses. 
And of course, the other woodland creatures and farm animals said, yeah, but there's not big bad wolves in those parts of the world. Anyway, so he carries on, he builds his house out of straw, and that does not work out very well. And then the next little pig, what he built his out of sticks and uh, wood. And I'm sure some of the other little creatures said, uh, not sure that's a good idea. Look what happened to uh, the house made out of straw. And he probably thought, well, but I'm a better builder. I have some natural attributes that will lead to me creating a better house. I'm going to be fine. And it didn't work out very well for him either. And the third little pig probably had similar life experiences to the first two. And I'm sure he considered building his house out of similar materials. But he was able to take a step back, look at the evidence in front of him, and listen to the advice that was being given to him. And he decided to go a different direction. And he built his house out of bricks. A little side note here, interesting. They weren't just any ordinary bricks. They were BJJ bricks. So (laughs) (laughs) extra strong house. (laughs) Okay, so so how to wrap this back into jujitsu. I think we all come in uh, with varying degrees of preconceived ideas when we're grappling and sometimes those preconceived ideas may actually be reinforced by early success as a white belt you know if you maybe were in a wrestling club in junior high or grade school and you picked up some skills and and then you had success uh you know in in your backyard wrestling goofing around with your friends you were always kind of king of the mat so to speak and you come in uh jujitsu and you have some early success with some things that aren't necessarily technically correct but you're strong and athletic and you've been doing them for years and you'll keep chasing down that path and you'll have coaches and upper belts tell you that you know that's not going to work against uh, blue belts it's not going to work when you advance through the ranks and um, I guess the lesson is this the sooner we can uh, listen to other people and kind kind of uh, let some of these preconceived ideas go the, the faster we'll progress that's my take anyway Joe, I actually think that's the best lesson we've had. You know, I like kind of how you threw in the three little pigs. I had no clue where you're going. Um, and I still didn't really know where you're going until you got to the third one there. And I do think that's a big thing we do see in jiu-jitsu. And, and I can, you know, think about when I first started. When, you know, when I first started, I remember my very first tap was probably – a year into the sport, you know, that's how bad I was. It took me that long uh, to get my first tap. But I remember I got it with a can opener, you know, uh, which uh, (laughs) is not a a great move or anything, but I was so happy. But I do remember my training partner, Byron, back in the days, looked at me and said, hey, what are you doing? That's a new guy, and you're tapping him out with a can opener, you know, something that could hurt his neck, uh, something that doesn't work against uh, better people. And But I was all happy. And I remember there were a couple times where I had early success with something that's not going to work later on, but, but I was happy. I, I was looking for a, a short-term gain, you know, something that wasn't going to happen in the long run. And um, it's, you know, I, I need to open my ears. Uh, you know, God gave us two ears and one mouth. I need to listen twice as much as I talk. And I don't think I was listening to people in, in position to help me out at that point. And, uh, you know, my, I suffered early for that, um, you know, just chasing, you know, a win, even on the practice, in the practice mat, chasing a win, which nowadays I look at it, that's ridiculous. I don't know, you know, how I was that dumb to actually be that short sighted to see that that's not going to help me, you know, down the long run, down the long road. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I like how you equated it to short and long term uh, success. That's probably what gets most of us uh, stuck with our preconceived notions is that uh, instant gratification. So anyway, that was our life lessons based on the three little pigs. Three little pigs are okay. Three little nipples are not. Uh, (laughs) haven't heard from byron yet uh, but gary maybe you can field this one uh get back to byron's wife she just messaged and said he's having second thoughts he's not sure the uh uh inconvenience of the surgery is going to be worth the removal so (laughs) yeah well you you think about it because he's probably going to be off the mats for you know a couple weeks you don't want any staff to grow in that and because that's what Byron thought it was at first, you know, like an ingrown hair, a little staph infection from the mat, 
but it turned out to you know be the lactating third nipple. And um, but is it really worth the inconvenience? I mean, you know, you got to go under. Who knows what's going to happen? And you know, if any of you guys uh, listening want to uh, send us a, a email or, or write something on our page, uh, you know, to um, you know, should Byron do it or not? You know, we could, I guess we could start a little poll going. Um, it'll probably be too late because by the time we get it, he's supposed to be getting it done any time now. But uh, you know, we could we could let him know. But I mean, Joe, you take a think about it. He never fixed his web feet. I mean, really, do you need to? I mean, that your toes are all stuck together and with webs. It's you think of the advantages. The guy swims like you wouldn't believe. Remember, he was talking. Of, a year ago about doing the um, uh, Ironman uh, triathlon and he had never swam before and he had to really learn to swim and he got up to swim in a mile really quick and I guarantee I couldn't have got up to swim in a mile that quick but I don't have web feet so think of the advantages that has so maybe the uh, the third nipple could have some advantages and then uh, he'll be on the mats and not have to get put to sleep yep so uh, he may be getting a little bit attached to that thing. But anyway, uh, on with the show. What's next, Gary? <laughs> Joe, we have a quote of the week. And this one, uh, we've got it from a pretty famous guy. Uh, the guy uh, called Confucius. Um, I don't know what his last name is, but I think it might be Confucius Thomas. Would you be related to him, Joe? Uh, he's a great, great, great uncle on my dad's sister's side something like that well, you, you know it's crazy like all those years that the when it finally got to you that all of his knowledge is gone now you know once it got to your <laughs> lineage <laughs> but yeah uh, <laughs> but confucius said it does not matter how slowly you go as long as you do not stop and we kind of just talked about uh with Joe's life lesson, you know, about the the marathon of jiu-jitsu. And that's what jiu-jitsu is. It is a marathon. And, you know, I started 16 years ago. I I, I guess I really did think I was going to still be doing jiu-jitsu. I think a lot of people are like, hey, I can't believe I'm still doing this, you know, 10, 15 years later. But, you know, I like jiu-jitsu. And if I like doing something, I'm going to do it for a long time. But let's go back to the it does not matter how slowly you go as long as you do not stop. You know, we're going to get better. Jiu-Jitsu takes a long time. You know, I was uh, training a couple new people yesterday, and they were telling me how these moves are so awkward to them. It's something they've never done before. They never wrestled. Uh, you know, they were probably traditional uh, baseball, basketball, football players. So, you know, shrimping, you know, as Joe always says, shrimping ain't easy. Uh, but a lot of these positions are stuff we're not used to. So they feel really uncomfortable. And they were asking me, it's like, man, watching you do the, do these, you know, just movements, you look like you've been doing this forever. And I was like, I have, but I was in your same boat. The key is to just keep going. And you, you're going to get better at it. It's going to become natural and, and don't stop. It's, a, it's such a long journey. You know, you're always going to be learning. I'm 16 years in right now, and I still learn stuff every single day I'm out there on the mat. And I did have a few years, well, probably not a few years, probably a year, where, you know, life was crazy. My kids were really young. I was working a lot of hours. And for that year, I probably only trained once a week, and it was every Saturday morning. That was a really uh, free time for me where I could easily get out. And that was about the only time during the week I could. And I, I just remember, I had a couple people telling me, it's like, man, that's all you're training? And I was like, man, that's really all I can do. And I just remember the look at some of those people, like, that it was worthless for me to train, you know, one day a week. And, you know, just the look they gave me. They didn't necessarily say it to me, but I could, I could tell just the way, you know, they acted when I told them I only trained one day a week. But I'm telling you, I learned so much in that one day. And it kind of really got got my love for jiu-jitsu really, you know, really high, really going there. Because what happened was if I could only train one day a week, man, all my energy was devoted in that one day. I could not wait. Like it'd be Sunday afternoon and I would be waiting for Saturday morning because I knew I could get on the mat. You know, that was my good time. That was the time, 
you know, I was going to be high. And, you know, I don't mean it in a bad way, but it's my jujitsu high. And, you know, I still learned so much stuff. I was so devoted and so excited to train that one day a week. Injuries were not a factor because I had a lot of time to heal. And that one year, I did gain a lot only training one day a week. So, um, you know, the key is I could have took that whole year off and fell behind based off of that year. Or I could have trained the one day I could easily make it and i i got major gains that one year that's awesome gary during that uh one year were there other guys that trained three or four days a week that got better faster than you you know i really didn't see that um, awesome yeah i you know i guess i was probably five years into my journey so you know i was kind of farther along but i kind of used it instead of trying to learn new stuff I just learned, I, I just tried to sharpen up what I had. You know, let's say uh, I'm good at Kimuras. And what I tried to do that year, instead of really learning Barambolas and, you know, flying triangles, I just stuck to, let's make my Kimura better. So I really didn't expand outside of my area code. I just really, you know, nailed down everything that was in my area code and, and tried to get better. Or as we call it, I tried to get better at my brick. And during that year I trained, I didn't really do, because I only had two hours to train. So what I would do is I'd spend the first 15 minutes, you know, doing a little bit of drilling or, or working on that move. And then I would just roll the rest of the time, which is my favorite. And, you know, I don't know if that's the right way or the wrong way to do it, but uh, it worked for me. And, and you know, rolling is my favorite, so I wanted to get in a lot of rolling. But um, uh, I, I really enjoyed that year. I mean, I, I don't like only training one day a week, but uh, I just remember – that was the year I was never so excited whenever I could get on that mat. And I think absence makes the heart grow fonder. When I couldn't train as much, I was just so excited. Every time I got out on the mat, you guys probably looked at me and thought I was like some kind of weird serial killer with that funny smile I had on my face as I stepped on the mat. You, you, got, you say that in a past tense uh <laughs> we still we still look at you and wonder if you're some kind of weird serial killer. Hey, just don't just don't dig in my backyard and everything will be okay. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. You know, should make make a note. Uh, we talk frequently about how to get better at jujitsu and your training time is limited. And uh, you mentioned not uh, trying to learn a bunch of new stuff, but focusing on just sharpening the game that you already know. And hadn't really thought about that before, but that's a very good point, Gary. Thank you, Joe. Yep. Uh, co compliments all around when it's just the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you notice there's been no busting on anybody. I, I mean, we haven't even busted on Byron. We're just kind of letting you, letting it, letting everybody know what's going on. Hey, speaking of that, I know Byron doesn't text me anymore because he's uh, kind of upset with me on over something. But has he texted you yet to let you know uh, what's going on with his surgery? Well, he 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 texted me not to let me know what's going on with the surgery, but I I think he's uh, getting ready to undergo the procedure. He must be under the effects of the uh, sedatives already. He said he texted me and said, "I've never told anyone this, but the reason I prefer training in the gi is I'm embarrassed by my scrawny arms." So, cat's out of the bag now. Uh, Byron, it's okay. Not everybody can be built like Gary. You know, Byron, what what we can do is come up for a game plan. You know, he, he's upset with his scrawny arms, and that's why he likes to train in the gi. Why don't we just have him, you know, maybe I'll get him a gym membership, and what we can have him do is right off the bat I'll tell him to go over the squat rack and do curls in the squat rack, and, and uh, you know, that'll build up his uh, arms. So maybe we can get some bigger arms on him. Yeah, that's a great way to make friends and influence people at the gym as well. <laughs> Yeah, people love it when you use the squat rack for curls, but uh, we won't let Pirate know that. Yep. Uh, Joe, I think it's time to get on to our interview with uh, the one, the only, Elliot Marshall. All right, let's roll. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. I have tapped out many black belts with what I call a reverse arm bar. I bend the elbow the correct way. No one knows why so many black belts have tapped to this, but they do. When I'm cutting weight and I'm hungry, I've been known to eat 
my opponent's fear by the bowl full. My thumbprint is on the pattern of a gold weave key. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick Podcast. Stay sweaty, my friends. All right, my friends, I'm excited to bring Elliot Marshall to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Elliot, welcome to the show. Thanks, Byron. Thanks for having me, and I appreciate it. I'm excited to have you here. Uh, former UFC uh, fighter, you're uh, also big in the jiu-jitsu world. Uh, but tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of bring us up to speed if we don't know uh, who you are out there. Mm, you know, yeah, I grew up I grew up in New Jersey, and then I moved to Colorado to go to college. I, uh, I did martial arts my whole life uh, in New Jersey and whatnot, and then um, – Started started getting into jujitsu right at the end of uh, my my stint there, and uh, when I got to college, I met uh, my my teacher now business partner Amal Easton, and uh, yeah, man, just like fell in love. I, I I got a minor in mathematics and a major in Brazilian jujitsu. <laughs> was it was it hard to so, uh, to to train and uh, and study <laughs> such a hard topic at the same time? Um, was it hard? I got so lucky, Byron. I don't even know what to say. Like my whole life is just like this, this big ball of luck, you know, like I would happen to like walk into tests. Like I, I'd been training for a month, didn't go to school and I don't recommend this. Right. And just like woke up one random day and said, Hey, let's go to college. Let's go to class today. You know, we, we were taking the day off and I walked into a test and then somehow I got a fucking B. Well, you know, or B minus. I, I don't know, man. Like, like who, who, who gets like who? That's that's not like that's nothing but luck. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know if luck is. I think you're you're maybe you're good at math and you were following following uh, things that uh, that you were good at as far as with the, with the study in school. Is that is that possible? Yeah, no, that's possible too. And like, I had sometimes I had like with my math classes, I had like a group of friends that I met like early on and I was like, and like, they were just like super nice. Like they let me, uh, they would just, they would just like, let me come to their study group the last like three days before an exam, you know, but I couldn't really do that too much with the math classes, like just show up. That was kind of hard, but I didn't do a lot of work. Um, and, but when I, when I, I would show up to these like focused study groups before tests and like, and, and just like figure it out for the test. Like I couldn't, like I, I can memorize for a short period of time well, and, and then just like I, I don't have it anymore, you know. Like I got nothing of that, but it's all good, you know. <laughs> so far, it's worked out. <laughs> so that was that was you kind of found jujitsu in in the college age. Yeah, yeah, right around the college age, and then I, you know, I competed in jujitsu a ton, like through my through. Uh, you know, like the, my mid to late college years, uh, and then my early twenties. And then, and, and then, you know, I just try, I traveled all over the world competing in jiu-jitsu, not all over the world, you know, all over America and Brazil competing in jiu-jitsu. And then, um, and then, yeah, like moved, made a, made a nice smooth transition to MMA where I got on the ultimate fighter and then, uh, you know, fought in the UFC and, um, obviously I'm not a champion. And now I, uh, yeah, you know, had, had some fights, had some good fights, enjoyed fighting, hated fighting. It's that love hate thing. And then, you know, moved on from that, opened my schools with Amal Easton. You know, we, we, we took his, what were small jujitsu schools and we transitioned them to larger, um, like more, uh, not MMA, you know, but just larger training facilities. We do have an MMA team in Denver, but we're not MMA focused. You know, we're, we are Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Muay Thai kickboxing focused. Why is it that you don't don't uh, target that market? Mm, because I don't believe. Um, I, I think the culture of MMA is very difficult, and and the culture that we have with our athletes that do fight MMA, they buy into what we do uh, uh, holistically as a community, where um, we. We care about each other. The, the cult, the, the, the Easton is first, you know, like the people there are always first. It's never an individual that's first. And that's hard to swallow for some athletes, you know? Um, 
And, and the reason being that we do that is um, we wholeheartedly believe in um, that this is a journey. And if in, and I wholeheartedly believe that even, even if you're the champion someday, but at the end of that, all you have is money and belts and no relationships or friends or, or any community to fall back on, um, you, you have nothing, you know, you have absolutely nothing. You're, you're as poor as a, you're as poor as somebody living in a favela. Yeah. Life is about maybe, the... maybe, 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 maybe even poorer because those people at least have each other, you know? Yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> you know, li- life is a lot about relationships and, and the qualities of, of those that we, that we build. And, and I've, I think I can feel that too. Like in the jujitsu gym, it just, something about that environment cultivates building relationships with your training partners. And it, I haven't not, I'm not an MMA guy, but that might be different in an MMA gym where, um, I, I think there's probably still that brotherhood there, but I don't know for me, the striking arts, it, like when people get hit, Sometimes they hit harder than they should have, or they they get upset with it, and, they, and it just escalates. And in jujitsu, it doesn't really escalate. <laughs> like, oh, nice sweep. Oh, that was a nice joke. Yeah, I love my guys that I fought MMA with. I'm still tight with a lot yeah. of them. You know, it's not bad. It's just the, if there's just something about the culture of MMA that it, it's fighting, right? And we all know how dirty the business is. It's not. It's not a nice business. So, um, yeah, it's about money. It's, a, it's money focused. Right. It's, it's money focused. So and um, I don't I try really hard not, you know, I uh, I had a breakdown. I call it a mental breakdown. So I spiritual waking a couple of years ago and um, I had to come up with some like guidelines and principles for my life and which I'm glad to talk about my breakdown. And, and, and that's what my podcast and, and my my upcoming book are about. Um, but one of those is I don't do anything for money, you know, Um Obviously, we all need money to survive. It can be a good indicator of like if your business is successful, if you're a business person. But I do things for another reason. I have to love what I'm doing. And if I really, really love what I'm doing, then like all the rest of that stuff, that will take care of itself. I don't, um, I don't, I don't concern myself too. Like I concern myself as I have to. Like my kids got to eat and stuff. But I'm not like, uh, all right, I could go, I could go do that and make, make, you know, a thousand dollars, and it would just be you know, a hell, but I'll, I'll do it. You know, I'm and that's again, a little bit of luck that I've been able to have, with, you know, with my life. Yeah. So you, you mentioned, uh, your post, your podcast, gospel of fire, your book by the same name. Uh, tell me a little bit about yeah. that, that, uh, change in your life. God, man, I had everything, right? Like I, I had like a great, great schools, great family, great wife, great kid, you know, every, you know, like everything that somebody could want. Like I wasn't flying on private jets anywhere. You know, I'm not saying like, <laughs> like that kind of everything, but I had everything somebody could want. Um, and I was just like waiting for it to crumble. Like, uh, you know, like, and what happened was I crumbled. Like I, I fell apart. Um, and I just racked with anxiety and I've struggled with anxiety my whole life. Um, but this was probably one of the worst bouts. Like I did, I couldn't sleep. Um, panic attacks, like just the whole, the whole nine. And, and what really saved me was just making sure that just going to the school, it really helped save me, you know, um, and, and then and then finding some guiding principles of my life. Like uh, I'm not a religious person, um, but I get the idea. I needed to find a God. I needed to find something that um, that couldn't be broken. You know, that that no matter no matter what, that was that was, num- you know, that was number one. And for me, that was how to be the best dad, you know, how to be the best parent possible for my kids. And um, so and it can never be achieved and it can never, and it can never, and you're never, and you're never done with it, you know? So that's, that's kind of like my North star, what I point my life at. And, um, yeah, it kind of got me out. And then I realized that we, one of the things that's wrong, I think with what is going on sometimes is we sit in our houses and we don't really connect with people and we don't communicate with people and share our experiences, our good and our bad. You know, we like to bitch about them or, 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 um, or brag about them on social media, you know, um, with how great things are or how terrible something is, and you know, but we don't actually like sit down with somebody and like, we'll, we'll comment on their feed, but we won't go have a cup of coffee with them. Yeah. And I, and I realized that we need to do a little more of that, you know, a little more, a little less me and a little more we, you know, like, cause we're all kind of in this together. 
So um, that's what the Gospel of Fire, uh, both the book and the podcast, are about. When you had all that stress and, and, and stuff hitting you and, and it all kind of came to a an, an end or like you like, okay, something's got to change. Why did it happen then versus, you know, six months earlier or six months later? What happened on, on that week or day or month or whatever? Man, you know, I really don't know, but I don't like that. I don't, I really don't try to think about stuff like that. The only thing, the only why that I know is why I exist, you know? I, I exist for a very specific reason, um, and that reason is to be the best parent possible. Okay. So, but, but that's like, it. I, I, I don't know why. Yeah. I, you know, like why does it doesn't end? I I I still have it. I'm not. I, I don't get very concerned with with um with that. I, I I welcome it. I'm like fuck yeah, let's roll. You know, if my anxiety comes and wants to rear its head again, like it it, it like it does. I don't want it to go away. I say, hi, how you doing, man? Like, like the devil's here and we're, we're going to dance with him. So I'm not, I never get too like, but that, but that is what helps me deal with it. You know, like, because when you want something to go away, you know, that's when, that's when things start to get a little, a little uglier for you. Yeah. It, it, I'm just trying to think of it like other people trying to maybe in a situation where they're like trying to, make a make a life change or something and you need that kind of that tipping point where um like okay this is enough <laughs> like I, I can't I, live this said, lifestyle okay. anymore like that you know what i mean and maybe it was having 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 kids or oh, something like that right no but you but that's the, no 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 you can live it you can that's what you have to realize right because what you can't do like and this is where people get get in the get get it gets very difficult for people you you can always do right now think about when you're training Right. Think about the most tired time that you've ever been training. Right. Now. You were doing that very second. Right. Yeah. What you were nervous about what was making you more tired was, are you going to be able to do in a minute? You're just focused on the wrong thing. Do right now. All you want to do is accomplish right now. And when you accomplish right now, that's all you have to worry about. There's nothing else to accomplish. Just the moment that you're in. Like right now you are mounted or, 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 or somebody, your buddy has his arm around your neck. You can't worry about passing his guard. <laughs> what do you have to worry about? You have to worry about stripping that grip on your neck and dealing with him on your back. That's what the problem is. Right? So if that's the problem, deal with, deal with that. So if you're, if you're racked with anxiety... Just do today. Just do right now. Get up, make your bed. Do something positive right away. Not something huge. We try to make these huge changes in our lives and, and, and you, you, you don't even know where to start. Start with one thing positive. And when you do that one thing positive, things will just keep going and going and going. You'll be able to start doing more and more things positive. It's going to take some time. It's not going to change real fast. You know? Like for me, I, I get up and I meditate right away. The first thing that I do, in the, I go to the bathroom and then I meditate. Because right away, boom, I accomplished something. Does that does meditating early in the morning like that, does that kind of set the tone for the rest of your day? My day, my, I might have good things in my day, I might have bad things in my day, but I, but they don't get to have my day. I have my day, you know? I get to have my day because I started on a positive note right away. You know, so, um, and, and I just, and I just go through it there and like, it's really interesting. People want to meditate and then they, like, you think you're going to feel better right away. And that, it doesn't happen like that, you know? Yeah. Um, it, it takes time. You have to, it, it's a long term process. It's like getting good at jujitsu, right? Um, what, what belt are you buying? I'm a black belt. You're a black belt. Awesome. Um, I, did you realize when you were much better passing the guard or did it just kind of like, Oh shit, a couple years later, you're. You're passing the guard. Like, you don't feel like you're, ever, like you're not like, oh shit, today's the day that I can pass the guard. You know, like it's just like gradual process. And then, you know, like uh, Rafael Walter shows up to your school and you don't pass his guard, you know, because, you know, it's just a different dance, right? Like, yeah. It's a different dance with a different devil. So it's not like this thing that you're just like, oh, I can, you know, that you have all of a sudden, you know, and, and that's the same thing with, with life, right? Like, you know. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta be able to dance with with whatever devil shows up. 
Yeah. I, it, I'm a big believer, like, life is mostly how you react to it. I mean, good things happen, bad things happen. People, Some people have an, an ability to take a good thing and to feel like it's a bad thing, you know? like, <clears throat> But, it, like, we all have things that happen to us that are bad. It's how you approach it yeah, and how you deal with it. We call them snowflakes. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah, you know, we call it, yeah, you know, it's how you deal, right? It's how you deal with, with you know, like I, like I said, nobody gets to have my day. My day is mine, you know? No, no, it's no one else's. No one can ruin it, not nobody, you know? So your your biggest, um, your, your biggest focus right now, uh, being the best father that you could be, is that is that what I caught? Yeah, yeah, no, and you know, so I had to ask myself how I do that. Yeah, and I do that by sh- showing them what the best adult looks like. You know, because nobody who, do you like. I don't like to be told what to do. You don't like to be told what to do. My kids don't like to be told what to do, and they, you know, my youngest is five. He still hates. He fucking hates it, right? Like you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like when I show them how to how to like be a a good a good adult male, you know, I have, excuse me, I have, I have two boys. Then they can be like, all right, that's they mimic us. You know, they, they mimic, you know, they mimic the behaviors that they see, even when they're in that stage of, um, you know, rebelling against you a little bit. It's all mimicking of, of how you treated people one day, you know, that they that they might have seen or heard or, you know, they're they are You know, so we uh, I, sh- I try to really show them, you know, how to be a good friend, how to be a good husband, how to. You know, how to, how to do, do things that you don't like. You know, we have our six rules. Number one, you have to do jujitsu. Number two, you have to learn to swim. Three, you have to look people in the eye, demand respect and respect back. Four, if you're scared, you have to do it. Um, five, you make your money work for you. You don't work for your money. And then rule number six is you ride or die. You know, like if my brother goes down, I go down. How did you, how did you uh, come up with those rules? Well, man, like you should, if, rule number one was simple. I don't think there's a better, uh, there's a better teacher of life than, than the mat, you know? So if they can show me something that's better, they can break rule number one, but that's going to be a hard conversation. <laughs> um, rule number two, rule number two, they swimming is, is a kind of a is literal and metaphoric. Um, swimming, uh, drowning children is the number one cause of death for kids over two. So you better know how to swim. Um, uh, rule number and then metaphorically like man sometimes you just got to tread water yeah right but you got to know how to swim you just got you just got to keep your life you know light we know that life comes for us so you better you got to be able to just keep your nose and your mouth above the water yeah you know don't fucking drown don't drown it's, don't drown it's uh you know? so that, that's an interesting one if you i mean it it's that i'm a i'm a firefighter and i've unfortunately okay. been to things where uh, kids mm-hmm. couldn't swim, and the the thing is, it's not the kid that doesn't swim that usually is the one that drowns. It's the one that doesn't know how to swim. Like once the kid gets that fish like status, like they they're good at swimming, they're usually pretty safe. You know, they they, they there's different mm-hmm. things that could happen in the water, but it's the kid that the parents like, no, swimming is dangerous. I'm not going to do that, and and kind of uh, shy away from that. Kids are curious about water, <laughs> and it's just like get in there and learn it, and then you know obviously you need supervision and that sort of thing even when you're when you're good at it, but um, it becomes yeah. a lot safer to, to to tackle that. It's like if you don't want somebody to learn how to if if you're afraid of driving, you should learn how to drive safely. But to not learn how to drive and then need to drive one day that's a disaster. It's just like in jujitsu, man. Like I said, like this is why they can't get away from the mat. Um. Everyone's so afraid of, heel, of leg locks and heel hooks, right? Like the whole jujitsu community is afraid. Like, like even even still with today, with with like all the the Donahar stuff, you know, that's out there for us to learn from. People get so scared of the leg locks because people are going to get hurt. You know, that means you have to teach them better, right? You have, you have to teach them in a way that nobody gets hurt. And man, we've been you know we've been really diving in for for two and a half years now, three years, like since you know. And we've had no injuries. Yeah. You know, no, no. Look, okay. People are going to get hurt. We're doing it. We're doing a dangerous thing, but we've had no torn ACLs, knock on wood, right? Like no torn ACLs, no blown out anything, right? Like nothing because 
the way in which you, you dive into it deeply, you learn how to do it. You don't just say, hey, look, here's a heel hook. You know, you say, look, this is the breaking mechanics of a heel hook. This is why, this is where. If, and you know, we have a solid rule at the school. If somebody has your leg and your knee is in the line and two hands are on your heel, you tap, you don't, you know? Yeah. And then 50% on the other person. If you have someone's leg knee in the line and you have both of your hands on their heel you and they're not tapping you let go <laughs> you know this one role in the school means absolutely nothing nothing so how and this is part of the culture of the school how do we get by that right that can be difficult sometimes we, we do want to win our roles you know we do want to do that so um but that's you know like we want to see if we're improving and, and i get that i do too but not at the expense of the school, right? Not at the expense of another human being and, and what they're doing, because maybe they're making a mistake. Maybe they're having a rough day and they're, you know, and like, man, we don't, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to add to their rough day. So it's 50% on the person in our schools. It's 50% on the person getting leg lock and it's 50% on the person doing the leg lock. There's never like, bro, why didn't you tap? You know? And there's never like, bro, I was tapping. Like there was, there's the, that, that just does not occur. Is there a certain, uh, skill level you start leg locks or is it pretty early on? Mm, pretty early on. We'll start them at, um, heel hooks. We'll start, uh, at blue belt, um, straight ankle locks at white belt. And is that, uh, is that like the, the, during the no gi class or are you guys doing heel hooks with the geese on? Nah, man, there's no heel hooking with you. Okay. You can't escape. That's how, people, that's, how people, that's how people do get hurt. Well, I've <laughs> talked to some people. Um, I've had multiple times. Uh, Justin Rader being one of them that I can remember, um, he's like, he was not worried about that because he has got better control of your wrists. And and is like, they like he, he feels, at least he did a couple years ago when I talked to him, that he like a heel hook in the gi, he could, he could fight better. Uh, for the control of their wrist and have that grip. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, you know, at blue belt, so I'm like blue belt, but no gi. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> I think like no gi. Yeah, yeah. No gi. Okay. The uh, the comparison with swimming and 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 leg locks is like learning how to swim, but saying don't put your face under the water. Like learning jujitsu, but being like super, you know, avoiding of uh, of leg locks is kind of the same thing as not putting your face in the water. Like. It's part of the game. Oh, yeah, my, my five, mm-hmm. my five year old's just learning. Like, like he he's been able to swim for a couple of years now, but but in the ocean, he's with me still, and I'm still there, like like moving him and maneuvering him, like with him. Like he he can't go out and just do it on his own. Now my nine year old, he's pretty solid in the ocean. I can sit on the beach and he can be in the ocean. Now can he swim a mile away? No, you know, like that. Like to that, we still have to go do together. You know, um, so like there's levels to this shit, just like there's levels to the game. Yeah. Of jiu-jitsu. You know, like you can't just like, uh, parenting is work. Teaching jujitsu is work. You, you, it's not just say, hey, okay, oh, free train, go. That's, that's, that's a, you know, you have, you have to put some time and effort in on your students. You have to put some time and effort in on your kids, you know, and be consistent. You know, it's, it's hard, but that's, what's great about it. It's, you know, that, that's the beauty of, of jujitsu is that it, it's very, very difficult. It's the beauty of teaching jujitsu, you know, is that can, it's very, very difficult. Our, you know, if, if no one's showing up to your class, it's not because people are lazy. It's because you teach like shit. I'm curious, having, having the experiences you've had in, in, in MMA and having, having two boys that do jujitsu, um, if they, when they're getting a little bit older – and they start to get interested in doing MMA, would you steer them away from that or towards that? Or what kind of guidance would you give them on that? I always give my opinion, you know, of what I was, you know, but, but what they want to do with their lives, it's, it's their life. Let me tell you, my parents were not stoked when I told them I was going to be an MMA fighter, you know? So, um, and it still happened. They had no control over it. Yeah. So, I'd much rather be supportive of whatever journey that they're going to go on in their life as long as it's positive. Um, you know, I, I would not like to see them like selling crack. Um, <laughs> but, you know, 
But um, if they want to chase something, uh, that's part of being the best parent possible. My job is not to steer them. Uh, look, they don't have to be champions in jiu-jitsu when I say they have to do jiu-jitsu. Like, I could care less if they're champions, but they have to do jiu-jitsu. Um, but if they want to if they want to pursue other goals, then it's their life. My job is to be there as um, as the back of them while they they you know it, at, while they pursue this you know as their as their support as their rock as their like the, so that they know that their dad will always always like no matter what be there for them. Yeah. But if if you had to. Um... Like if they just wanted some guidance or some advice, would like if they're looking at either doubling down on jujitsu, going you know gi, trying to trying to do well, competing in the gi, or uh, doing MMA, um, which one would you say? Like, hey, you know, if they're looking for the guidance, what would you advise? Uh, MMA is terrible. It's okay, it's an awful experience. <laughs> yeah, man. Okay, like fighting, you you, you got to be ready for for just brutalness. You know, yeah. Like it's it's a terrible, terrible. It's a it's a terrible game. You know, you and you can have nothing at the end of it. Where jujitsu, you have a lot at the end of it. So if you do that right, you know, yeah, you can do fighting totally right and be and it could end up awful. That's uh, you said a lot right there. <laughs> um, I, I, man, look, fighting was one of the greatest things I ever did. I'm so stoked that I did it, but I am so fucking lucky. Because I I was I I was able to find my very next thing three days or four days after my last fight, you know, and that's that's rare, right? Like you see most guys fight again and da da da. It's a fucking te- te- you know, or they they're teaching at a UFC gym, you know, like trying to just make it. Uh, you know, everyone's not Conor McGregor. No one's Conor McGregor. You know, like you have a statistical percentage of zero of being Conor Conor McGregor. I agree with you. <laughs> I think jujitsu wins. If I mean, I'm not. I don't ever tell anybody not to train MMA or or to do that sort of thing. But um, I've told a lot of people, hey, try this jujitsu thing. And I'm just always amazed yeah. by people who who watch MMA and say, I want to do that. It's like, what is what is going How on in your don't. head? Especially when no, they have no, like it. zero training, they walk in the gym. I, I want to be an MMA fighter. Like, I think that they just think that they're going to win. Like, it, they they see the the offense, and they don't realize. You know what? There's also somebody receiving that offense, and that's statistically 50 percent of the time will be you. You know, like if somebody loses every fight, and uh, <laughs> I'm just amazed that that people walk in it's and like, say, "This is it's fun. like when you're 15 years old and you think you want to be a porn star, <laughs> right? Like you don't really want to be a porn star. Like if you actually had to go do that, that'd be fucking awful. You know, like everyone's like, "Oh, dude, you get, you know, you get to, you know, you're a horny 15 year old, right? You think you're gonna bang all these chicks." Man, dude, there's fucking cameras and again, 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 right? Like, Jesus Christ, it's not like you're having, like, this enjoyable time, you know? Like, <laughs> it, it looks sexy, it looks amazing, right? Like, you're like, holy shit, that girl was gorgeous, you know? Like, raising, like, you know, like what Max Holloway did this weekend, that was phenomenal, you know? Why don't you try being by Brian Ortega? Yeah, but it's just hard to, I, I guess, for people to realize what, what, uh, what it's like until you get there, I guess. I haven't, not an MMA guy, haven't been in any other businesses like that. <laughs> so, um, but for me, it's just the, the, the damage your body takes um, is, is crazy. It, like, including, you know, to me, it's the, the brain uh, trauma, getting, getting strikes to the head a lot that I would be concerned about. And then, you know, cutting weight regularly. Um, you had a lot of success pretty early on in jiu uh, pans, mm-hmm. blue, purple, and brown belt. Uh, what do you credit to, to being, to getting like that good start at jiu-jitsu? I had a great teacher that was still trying to get good at the same time that I was trying to get good. So we trained a lot. He brought a lot of new people in with a direct link to the, like he would had a direct link to the Gracie's, you know, okay. like, cause he moved a mall East and was lived in Brazil for a while. Like he lived in, he lived with Hanzo and high and, and all these other guys, you know, at some point in his life. So we had a very, a very uh, close connection. Like we learned from the source. Um, and, uh, you know, to be honest with you, I hurt my shoulder as a big guy. Um, so I had to only do one arm guard for a long time, you know, because I, I had a separated C joint for like four months. 
so I developed a guard, which um, in the in the early 2000s, most big guys at, at where I was at my level at the time, you know, they didn't have guards. You know, like you you wanted to be a top player. So uh, when I when I went and got back to health when I was healthy, I had a very difficult guard to pass for. You know, like what do you when you watch normal big guy matches, especially a blue belt, what do they do? They just like push each other around until somebody can like find a takedown, you know? Um, and then that person generally wins. <laughs> well, I pulled. I pulled all the time and I beat these other big guys from the bottom because they couldn't handle another big guy that actually had a guard. And um and then once I was able to put them on the bottom, it was like they were they were just hosed, you know. So Early that, you know, that really helped my early success. It gave me a lot of confidence. Um, and there's nothing like confidence at, at an early start, right? Yeah, that that does help a lot. And and did you play that same game through from blue, purple, and brown? Uh I don't know, yeah, yeah, I'm still playing that same game. I I could you watch my match this weekend? <laughs> I, I sat down. <laughs> it, it, it's it's inter- you know, it's always sat, interesting to me down. how um how, you kind of sometimes you, people choose a path and they just it, it works well for them and they and they're able to to do like a lot of the same things that they were doing at blue belt and white belt and I'm the same way. Mm-hmm. You, yeah, just hone your craft, man. Like, look, I can wrestle. If you want to wrestle, let's wrestle. But like, where I don't like, I don't like to. I'm not a college wrestler, right? So like, I still fuck up often in wrestling. You know, like I have like purple belt skills in wrestling. And when you have purple belt skills, what does that mean? You're like, you know, like you have the things that if you hit them, you got them, like you're good. But you also like just blunder, just absolutely blunder sometimes like a white belt. That's a purple belt, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a <laughs> so, you know, why, why am I going to dick around with some purple belt skills when I have these black belt skills over here? You said it well. I mean, it's, it's uh, especially when you're competing, you need to, to be playing that A game and, and work and do things you do best. Um, another thing I, and I wanna... I'm doing sub only right now. Like I'm only doing sub only tournaments. So fuck the takedown, <laughs> you know, for me, fuck the takedown. Like, let's just get to, let's just get to submitting each other. You know, let's just get to somebody try. Like, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to dick around on my feet for, for, you know, no way. Yeah. What about the sub only thing is, it, it, why are you, why are you focused more on that? I'm an old guy, bro. I'm an old guy. Sometimes I have to let somebody pass my guard when I get into a bad spot rather than fight like hell. You know, because like if I fight like hell, I'm going to hurt myself. You know, but when and so I can let someone pass and it means absolutely nothing. I replace, you know, I escape the side control well. So I, I get my guard back and there we go. You know, and then I start go back on the attack rather where like when you compete in the points tournament, um, you cannot allow the guard pass to happen. Right, you cannot. If you allow that guard pass to happen, most likely you're losing. You know, I think like um, when you watch that, right? When somebody passes another yeah. person's guard, not not end up in side control, right? Like if I take you down to side control, you know, um, I probably only have two points, right? But if I'm on top and I pass, like that 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 took a lot of work. Like uh, that that person generally wins a lot. You know, that the the, the passer of the guard. So, but they, you know, you, now you start to stall, yada, yada, things like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't, I, you know, I don't, I don't like dealing with that, you know? Yeah. Not, not that that's not, not that those guys aren't great, you know? You know, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm not like a sub only only are the monsters. Um, but for me at, at this stage in my life where I've got kids and I've got schools and I've got a wife, like I can't, um. And, you know, maybe a little conditioning too. You know, I can't, I can't be like charging, charging on my training, you know? So there's, those points tournaments probably, you know, like they, they do take a little more conditioning because you can't allow the guard pass, right? You have to yeah. fight like hell. Or I can just allow the guard pass, make sure that I'm safe, um, rest a little bit if I have to rest and then recover. And it's like, it's like, uh, there's, there's no skin off. There's no, there's no loss. Yeah, and also being really hard to submit is uh, that that mm-hmm. <laughs> that takes away the main way that they, they could win. They can't be up on like points and then kind of you know the match grinds to a halt and you lose. If you can't submit you, yeah, you're not gonna lose. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but in the in the sub only tournaments, like in the fight to win, you can't get put in a lot of submissions either, right? Even if you escape, you're still losing now. You know, yeah. So you have to have really you have to have good defense in a lot of ways, not just uh, not just uh, like getting out of submissions. Yeah. You have to like be able to not get put in them as well. You yeah, know? it's far it's far better to escape the position than to try to be in a position where you're escaping out of actual submissions. That's that's a for me, that's always a nightmare. I would really escape side control all day long, then escape your darts from side control. You know, like <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I mean. It's just so much easier to just escape the position. I agree. So, you credit a lot of your early success with the the, the training and the um, and being around really quality people who are also wanting to get better. Um, how? So, I I look at most jiu-jitsu gyms, and people tend to focus on getting like having the best instructor and and that is a big piece of the puzzle in having a good jujitsu gym but another big piece which is often overlooked is the culture of the gym and how students treat each other and how they uh how they grow and that sort of thing tell me a little bit about uh the culture uh of the of the eastern training centers well it bleeds from the top down right it bleeds from the top down how are the best guys training you know, and if the best guys are training in a way where I'm here to get better, not see who is better, now we've got something, right? Now we can, now we can, now we can build upon that, right? But because if you're here to see who is better, that 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 you you know you're going to have this top dog mentality, and that that's going to scare people away. People do not want anything to do with that, you know. When you come into Easton, man, like you, um, from from the time that you hopefully make the phone call or walk in the door, whichever one of those is your first experience to the time that you're on the mat, you know, it should feel like, it should feel like church. You know, it should feel like church, maybe with some cursing going on. If I'm teaching, cause I do curse, you know, and maybe with some, some, um, some pressure being applied to you that you don't necessarily want at the time, but it should feel like an experience that's changing your life not something that where you're just learning how to beat people up. Like the beat people up, the jujitsu is the secondary part. It's the vehicle that we travel down to have a better life. And that's the goal that we're, that we are, I, I could care less how many champions I make, but man, if I make great people, now we're talking. So if, how's that done? Like, like, okay, you're teaching armbar today or whatever how do you get to be also uh, changing character and, and developing uh, great people? It's not, it's not just the, um, the activity so, so, of jujitsu yeah, because it doesn't happen yeah, in every so, gym. Right. So look, man, when I teach, I'm like, guys, look, here's the deal. Moves don't work. We have to keep moving. You know, you have, you have to keep moving. So I never just teach an arm bar, you know? So if, if today's the, if the lesson is arm bar today, um, you are going to have to sweep me, get up in my guard, and then I'll teach you. Then we'll then we'll go over the iron bar from the guard, you know. Or maybe we'll you'll sweep me past the guard. I'll escape, put you back in the guard, and then I get to do the iron bar, you know. Because things happen in, in jujitsu, right? Uh, too many times, like even if, for example, if we're teaching past the guard, you know, um, when when we teach just the passing of that guard, I I feel like. Um, people start to learn a move. And when you learn a move, you think that that's the end of the role. You know, the end of the role is, uh, is the finish. You know, it's the finish. So if I'm going to teach past the guard today, but you know, in the, in the fundamentals classes, in the beginner classes, you have to teach a little more, like, you know, a, a little more move based because they don't know the moves yet. But for example, um, by the time you reach like the intermediate level, which for us is about, uh, you know, four to six months, somewhere in there. Um, once you, you know, you've learned an Americana, so you can always do the Americana, right? Like, so if I'm teaching past the guard, um, I'll have you sweep your partner, which you already know, like a very basic hook sweep or something like that. Or um, you stand up and we learn how to pass. And then after you pass, you sub, you secure the side control and I finish you. I finish you, boom, Americana. Like, you already know that. I don't have to teach that, right? I don't have to teach the hook sweep. And then I stand up off of you. You sweep me. And now, boom, I do the guard. You do the guard pass that we learned how to do today, you know, slowly controlled. And then, boom, you hit the Americana. So the partners keep moving. 
right? They have to be working with each other. You have two people that are that are always engaged. You have to be worrying about the, the other person in the game, and you know that you're working with them. This is this is how you build culture. You don't necessarily see it, right? But it's never focused on you. It's focused on on the group that you're like the two of you, you know. And and we have to do this together. And it's never my turn and your turn. It's we we both always have a job to do. You know, and that is, you know, um, that helps when we train. Look, man, we all tap because we're here to get better, not see who is better. You know, we all tap. I tap, you know, I trained on Thursday. I competed last Saturday. I trained on Thursday and I got finished. And I say nothing. I just get finished, you know, because I got to have fun, man. You know, I got to, I, I can't, it can't be so serious. This isn't life and death. You know, it's life and death is our life. So you better have this avenue, this place to go to make that all better so that you can get some help with that. And that's how we do it, you know. Um, we care about our students. We talk to our students. We, we, we try to inspire our students, you know. The way in which we train, the way in which we structure the class. and You know, it, it, it's work. Like, you know, it's, it's not just show up. Okay, guys, look, man, man, like, look, you pass, you pass the guard like this. Good, okay, you try, good, you try. I go sit on the wall, look at my cell phone, you know? All right, guys, okay, bring it in, everybody, ready, go, blah, 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 yo, yeah, good, okay, let's train in. You know, that, that, that doesn't cut it. Have you ever had the, like, a student who was, I don't know, toxic to the, uh, the culture in the gym? And, and how mm -hmm. do you deal with that? We talk to them. Yeah. You know, we did some chances. You know, we, we've had to kick people out. You know, people that I like even personally. But it, he just, the person, they, they can't stop hurting somebody. You know, and after a couple times of them hurting somebody, if, if I keep them around, then it's my fault the next person they hurt. You know? Yeah. I think that's a, uh, so <laughs> I, I like the answer. And I've, uh, I think the the old method, and I've been guilty of this as well, when somebody's misbehaving or you know a little too rough with a new guy or whatever, the, the old method was you beat them up, <laughs> you roll hard with them, you yeah. smash them, you oh, show yeah. them, hey, this is yeah. what it's supposed oh, to be. Yeah. What what do, people don't like to be told what to do, right? They like to be shown what to do. What did you just show them? Yeah, you showed that showed that person that when you can, you fuck somebody up. Right. Yeah. When you have the ability to, you do it. That is the lesson you just taught. You didn't teach them, uh, hey, don't do that. You taught what you taught them was, all right, when I get my opportunity, I'm going to do that to somebody else. Yeah. Now, look, I'm not like I'm, I'm all for it now. Ass beatings, you know, like 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 that's fine. But in, in the right way, like when somebody comes to the school and they and they roll hard with me, you know, like if I don't know them, we shake hands and they go real hard right out the gate. I just let them finish me. You know, I just, I just, I just lay there, let them finish me. That make it so obvious, and they go, "Everything okay?" I'm like, "Yeah, man, you were trying to kill me. It's not, it felt like winning was really important to you, so I just let you do it." <laughs> yeah, you know, I just let you do it. And like, man, like if we want to build up to training hard, like that's fine. But like, uh, I don't, I don't just meet a girl and tell her to take her fucking clothes off. I say hello. You know, and, and, we, and we work our way there, you know, like, um, I, I at least say Netflix and chill, you know, <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> you know, and then, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm married to her. These are all just things that I hear about. So, <laughs> um, but you know, I, I, like, you know, we can work up to a very hard role, which is great. We can both be going very hard. Like, I'm, I'm, don't, I'm not, I'm not saying like this, this like putrefied way to do jujitsu. But if you, if, if when we shake hands, if you grab me and like, man, like, uh, just when you not, don't know somebody, what I'm trying to do. Yeah, man. You say hello, you roll soft, you, you work into the intensity and, and then, you know, yeah. But my my most common way is made up that all they want to do is beat me. I'm, I'm not okay with it. Yeah. My most common way to start rolling with somebody I don't know is usually to pull side control and, um, and see how they react to that. And then, uh, you know, I'm able to try to adjust yeah. accordingly, but it usually says a tone for, okay, he's not trying to kill me, <laughs> but I do like, the, the Harvard, huh? 
Yeah, he's not trying to kill me. I just agreed with you. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, no, having the uh, the conversation with the person who is training incorrectly is a big one that I think that, you know, like, I think we need to realize that it's not, you're not ducking somebody. You're not trying to change some like, like, yeah, you could tap them out and beat them up or whatever, but that doesn't solve the problem as this person is, is trying to murder everybody they roll with. Like, like that, the conversation needs to be had, not the hard roll, which, look, which can happen, look, but nobody learns yeah. that way. I kick those people out. Yeah. Like if I have to fuck you up, you get kicked out immediately. I had to do this a couple months ago. This guy went, this guy tried to break my arm, you know, like the same thing. Like I, like, you know, we were rolling nicely. He was going very intensely. I was trying to be very controlled. It's a bad situation, you know, and I, and I probably handled it wrong from the beginning. You know, I shouldn't have let the situation, I shouldn't have let him be in the class, you know? And then, um, I laid in size control. I let him have my arm and man, he was going on my arm so hard on the Kimura. I had to scream to tap, you know, I was like, no, no, no. Cause my arm was breaking, you know? And then, um, I was like, bro, what the fuck are you doing, man? And he goes, that's how the move's done. Pussy. <laughs> and I lost a little bit here, right? I, I was like, cool, let's go. And I fucked him up. And then I was like, okay, cool. Now you're leaving. <laughs> like that was it. That was, that was done. You know, so I'm not saying that like it gets ugly sometimes, but man, like I, 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 that's my fault in my opinion, how ugly that got, even though he was trying to break my arm, you know, it's my fault because I didn't, I didn't talk in a way to him before the class and, 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 and to the let to, and I thought I did. I just, but I didn't do it well enough, obviously to convey like, Hey, this is how we do things here, you know? And, um, so yeah, I fucked up bad. And then I ended up in a fight, you know, in front of, you know, but, uh, and I, and I felt bad. Now some people had never seen a fight before in, in real life. And they like, some of the new white belts came up to me and they're like, dude, that was the fucking coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. You know? Um, but I, I, I did not enjoy how that went down. That my, I'm not, I'm not making the world a better place doing that, you know? And I called that guy two days later and I apologized. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> it, even though he tried to break my arm. Yeah. <laughs> It, it's just his reaction in, in calling you names. Like we're not used to that in jujitsu, and clearly he doesn't train jujitsu like at a, at a normal place. And so, like when that happens, I, I think we we have a bigger reaction. Like, okay, this is really it's going against everything you stand for. Like, yes, we're training, we're rolling, but he's trying to he's fighting, he's name calling, he's like insulting as we get like, okay, he's not doing the same thing we're doing anymore. And it just like, I th- yeah, we all could have the same mm-hmm. reaction. Like, okay, I'm going to just beat him up. And then, but it is big of you to call them after you've cooled down. And it's like, not what we do here. Not intentional. Like, like you got in, I could tell oh, it was intentional. I told him it was intentional, but I, but I apologize for how we got there. Yeah. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Cause you know, I apologize for how we got to that situation in the situation. Like, um, he deserved exactly what he got. I won't say that, you know, but how, how, how we got there, um, he did not deserve, you know, he's a, he's a young man, probably had some struggles and, and some hard times in life. And I didn't, I didn't, uh, add to his better times, you know, I didn't, you know, and, and that is, you know, that was a failure, a hundred percent failure on my part, um, of how I ended up in that situation like that, you know, like where we were and how he was training and then what, and then, and then like, like, you know, him pushing me and yada, yada, and calling me a pussy afterwards. Like, yeah, I'm not going to let that go. You know, like that, like, uh, that ain't happening. But, uh, how we ended up there to start with was, was no good. Yeah. That's, uh, the good thing is that those type of events are rare. <laughs> um, I hope. Oh yeah. They're, they're very rare. They're very rare. Yeah. How are the, rare, you know? How are the fans? Have you noticed like a huge difference between like people who watch you uh, grapple versus the MMA style of fans? No, no, the fans are always the fans in person always treat you ever on the internet. There's trolls, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's all the same. Are like, there as many? The like, I, you know, I think the stage is bigger for MMA, but I, I always feel and like, the stage is bigger. Yeah. The stage is bigger. The stage is bigger. The culture is different, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you have Conor McGregor in MMA, like, you know, he's crazy, you know? And, and so, you, you know, it's going to attract more of that type of person. 
But like in person, face to face, everyone is always very nice. That's more about them, I think. <laughs> A statement about them. Um, I, I just I feel that people that watch MMA, most of them don't do MMA, and and most of the people that do jujitsu. Or, or that watch you are actually people who train and do it. And so it's a little, I, I, I don't know. And, and you don't, obviously you don't feel it, but like it's, it's a little bit different. And I can understand why did that guy tap there? Well, cause he, cause he tapped, you know, like people question that in MMA, but if you train in MMA, you, you might understand more why he tapped there or, um, you know, like, Hey, everybody loses. And, and, and <laughs> I, I don't know. I just think that the people who are watching and spectating jujitsu, are also competitors and also students and who love the sport uh, versus MMA. They're more just, they're more just fans. Yeah. The crowd, the crowds are a hundred percent different in, in MMA than in, in, in jujitsu, right? Like most of the people in the, in the stands are, are knowledgeable with jujitsu, but with, with MMA, they are not right. Like they just, they just watch MMA. I agree with you. But you don't think that there's an influence of the fact that, um, most people that that are watching uh, competitive jujitsu um, actually do it. Well, yeah, no, that I'm I'm agreeing with you. I'm not agreeing not, that, with not you. just and the knowledge look, base, but like the respect of the sport, the understanding yeah. of of what a right. good match looks like. And there's no alcohol, bro. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, there's there's no alcohol. Like, yeah, you go, if you sold alcohol at jujitsu tournaments, they'd, they'd get ugly. Yeah, right, like. You know, yeah, but like you know, you, you they, get, they that, get ugly. Some alcohol of those team rivalries adds, are pretty intense. Yeah, right. Like alcohol adds to that shit. Alcohol does not take away from it. So those guys that are you know in M- that are in jujitsu, like you know, most of the people in the crowd are, are going to compete soon, either that day or the next day, right? So yeah. they, um, where in the MMA, like even the other fighters in the crowd aren't going to compete soon. So they're fucking drinking. Everyone's drinking. There's alcohol involved. So that does not add to the, uh, to the atmosphere of, of what's going on. Now I don't, you know, I don't like, I, I don't want to give MMA a, a bad rap. You know, I, I, I enjoy MMA. Um, I watch it. It's very difficult. You know, yeah. um, I don't watch it a ton, but, uh, um, the culture of it versus the culture of, I mean, there's, there's a reason that, uh, I'm building a jiu-jitsu school, not not like charging after like going after acquiring a whole bunch of MMA fighters. And even me as the coach, like I'm the head coach of an MMA team, Elevation Fight Team, and uh, I personally only coach four of the guys, three or four of the guys. You know, I, I don't I don't want to be traveling to fights every weekend or anything like that. You know? Yeah. It, looking back or, or using that the past experience as a as a guide, um, if somebody has had success. At jiu-jitsu, like you did, you know, uh, competing early on in jiu-jitsu and, and doing very well. And they're wanting to, to do MMA. What advice do you have for them making that transition? Mm, you better be ready to suffer. Advice, get get good at everything. Get a purple belt at every skill level. You know, get a purple, get a purple belt at, at jiu-jitsu. Get a purple, uh, you know, I'd almost say a black belt at one, a purple belt at the other. Okay. At the other two yeah. others, right? Striking. You need to have some black. You need to be have black belt skills, and then once you once you get into it, look. What's really hard. What's really a struggle for MMA fighters is improving, right? Like because they're always trying to win, and that's that's even harder. And it's harder in MMA than it is in jiu-jitsu because they're going to be competing again. So um, to get them to back off and like get better. Is, is is a difficult thing. So in between fights, you 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 need to show up at every fight with with a with like where people are like, holy fuck, that guy's way better, you know? Yeah. And the only way to do that is to lose a little in practice, and that's a dichotomy that you have to play with. The the process of getting better are not the same as like the day you're trying to win, um, <laughs> and you need to be able to, to balance that. There's no winning and get. There's no winning and getting better in practice. Like go watch professional sports teams, right? They start out like they don't, they don't, they don't like when you go to a, uh, like the Denver Broncos practice, they don't play a football game every day. 
right? They practice plays. These are the plays we're going to get we're, that we're implementing in this game. And on Monday, they might be terrible. On Tuesday, they're getting, you know, like, man, these, you know, but they're not like, they're not like putting the pads on and, and with referees and blowing the whistle. Yeah. Right. That, that is not, that is not what happens. They dissect and break down small little pieces of the game. And that's what's got to happen in MMA too. Awesome. Oh, wait, uh, and I've we're moving a... that way, right? We're moving that way. Well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm, I spoke over you there. I said we're moving that way, right? Where more teams are understanding that it's not just like glove it up and fight today. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Elliot, I've had a blast talking with you, and learning from you today. Um, tell us how to connect with you, uh, where to find your podcast, and that sort of thing. Man, so you can find my podcast on uh, Apple iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, uh, Google Play, all over the place. It's called The Gospel of Fire. Um, so um, my, my social media, all of my social media is at Fire Marshall 205. Um, please don't ask me if I'm ever going to be 205 pounds again because uh, that answer is no. But at Fire Marshall, maybe when I die you know, of cancer or something like that, I, I might get down that low, but it's not coming anytime soon. But at Fire Marshall 205 and um, go check out my website, you know, where you can – where if you, if you just go sign up on my website, uh, elliotmarshall.com. You can find everything there. You can find my podcast there. My book will be coming out in February. Um, and you, you can get updates there about that. So, man, uh, I'm super excited. Uh, Byron, I, I thank you for having me on, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And definitely give us a shout when when the book comes out, and I'll put links to it. And uh, we're excited to, to, to see that as well. Sounds great, man. Guys, and man, you know, just, just keep to do hard things in our lives. You know, like do hard things in our lives because that will that will make you just a better person in general. You know, it makes you uh, you don't find very many people that are assholes that train jujitsu because it's hard and you get beat up. You know, you, you get beat up. And when you get beat up, you, you tend to be a nicer, calmer individual. Well said. Thank you so much. All right, Byron. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks again, Elliot Marshall, for being on the show. Great interview. Thanks for taking the time to to be here with us um guys if if you liked this interview if you like this show make sure and uh tell a friend uh share share the episode on social media we're on facebook uh we're on youtube i've seen byron post on instagram wherever you may be on fit social media you can find us and uh, let a friend know about the show yeah that's the biggest form of flattery uh, we can get you know we try to make a good show we, we try to talk about jujitsu we try to have some laughs uh, as we call it chokes and jokes but um when we see somebody sharing our you know our our uh podcast or our page or letting their friends know about it you know that's when we know you know maybe we did something right and it's so flattering to to hear somebody say hey my training partner told me about this show and i started uh listening to you guys so thank you so uh you know big thank you to everybody out there who takes the time to listen to us who takes the time to send us emails at bjjbrick at gmail.com let us know if we're doing something wrong let us know if we're doing something right uh you know we we as we were talking about earlier you know it's a it's a long journey we want this show to be better we're open to suggestions and uh, we're just trying to to bring out the best product uh, we possibly can that's a roger on that speaking of social media gary i found an article on the interwebs um it's entitled my best and worst mindset for bjj and it's on chujitsu.com or dot net uh it's by our friend chewy guys you should go there and check out his website he's got a lot of great articles a lot of good videos Um, And this one is my best and worst mindset for BJJ competitions. And from his uh, perspective, his best mindset is, I'm here to chase submissions and do the best BJJ I can. And his worst mindset is when he starts to worry too much about the outcome, starts to get in his head that, hey, maybe I can win gold at this tournament. I just have to do A, B, and C to win this next match. And he's worried about points and and gets too, too far on that side of the spectrum. Uh, Gary, what do you think about that mindset? You know, I like it. You know, I'm not here to win or lose. I'm here to chase submissions and do the best BJJ I can. You know, like like you were saying and, and like Chewie says, you know, sometimes uh, 
you know, that success can go to your head. You know, you're, you're just thinking, if I do this, I do that, I'm going to win. You end up losing. Um, uh, and it's, it's brutal. You know, it's, it, it's, it's tough, but you know, I, I love the part I'm here to chase submissions and, you know, he's basically, you know, the essence of jujitsu in, in my opinion, you know, a lot of people, you know, have your own opinions, but is the submission part, you know, he's just looking for submissions. Normally, if you're just out there chasing submissions, you're going to put yourself in good positions. Even if you're at the on the bottom, you know, let's say working a Kimura from the bottom, the guy's trying to pass out of your half guard, you go for a, a Kimura. Normally, it's going to stop the pass, you know, keep him from getting points. Even if you don't get it, maybe you stop the pass, maybe you then come up and sweep and get your points. Now you're on top. Now you're in a better position to get a submission. So, uh, you know, I just think submissions are the essence. Submissions are going to put you in good good position and you know i find myself when i roll against what i call a submission hunter somebody like like what i like there is i'm in here to chase submissions when i'm rolling against somebody who chases submissions and uh, i'm not first on the submission chain man my game's all off because all i'm doing is defending you know i'm defending one the guy's so good he he knows i'm defending he goes that second one and i'm in bad positions the whole time and uh my worst rolls and I'm saying worse roles if it was a competition or against a guy who's a, a submission chaser. Yeah, that they're forcing you to, to always be on defense and you can't ever mount your offense that way. That's a good point. I tell you, one thing I really like about the article, Gary, is I don't believe he's saying that this is black and white, that this is the best mindset for everybody. I, I like his title, My Best and Worst Mindset. You know, some guys might really excel in tournaments if they're more strategic and they're thinking about points and wins. I think part of his point here is whatever works for you, you've got to figure out a way to stay in that mindset and not let, as he pointed out, early success uh, kind of get you out of your mindset. I'll also say that tournaments can be uh, very chaotic and, and that can throw you out of your mindset. went to a tournament yesterday as a spectator uh, slash coach and... Man, the first uh, person I was going to coach, we were standing next to the uh, mat and she's got her gi on and she's been told, you know, don't go anywhere. You're coming up next. And then a a mat uh, next to us was like, oh, Victoria, you're supposed to be here for your no gi and and calls her over and and it's her very first tournament. And now she doesn't know what to do. And they're like, just just take off your gi and you'll be ready to go. And fortunately, she had on her no gi attire underneath. Um had another guy called and changed mats from one end of the gym to the other at the last minute. And yeah, these things can take you out of your game and you start to worry about other things. And you got to figure out a way that when you step on the mat, you're in the right mindset for you. That's going to cause you to succeed. <laughs> you're going to laugh at this one, Joe, but okay. uh, I was in the same uh, predicament one time I had entered a tournament and I did, the over 40 over 30 and the open i guess it was uh um, for my weight class no gi of course (laughs) but uh all three of them were basically called all three of my first matches were called at the same time (laughs) (laughs) and i i'll never forget i'm just sitting there it's like okay i was in the i was in the the pit for over 30 and then um you know, I hear the over 40 called and I hear the other one called and I was like, and, and it was because everything, they were supposed to all be at different times, but the tournament was running different. So I was like, oh man, what am I going to do? And, uh, so I just stayed where I was at and, uh, I was <laughs> like, I'm already here right now. <laughs> so, but yeah, that was, um, but what that does is I'm surprised I won my first match in that one, to be honest, because I was, it threw me off. It just got me totally, you know, not knowing where I should be at. Like, I thought my head was in the game at that point. But then everything, just that chaos comes. And I was like, oh, boy, you know, what am I going to do? My my nerves start really going crazy. You know, not that they weren't already, you know, high. And then, um, you know, boy, what do I do? There, I, and I didn't even have a coach. Like, there was like four of us who went to this tournament. So we were all kind of going. So I didn't have anybody to calm me down. And uh it's like that chaos chaos can really mess you up but you know going back to this article joe 
what I like what you said about uh, Chewy there is everybody is different. You need to find your own, um, you know, what works for you because what works for Chewy may not work for me, may not work for you. And, and basically he starts it off, my best and worst mindsets for BJJ competition. And um, so we're all going to be a little bit different. You just we have to experiment and find out what works great for us. Yep. So thanks, Nick Chewy Albin, for uh, putting great content on the Internet. And guys, if you haven't checked out Chew Jitsu, go ahead and go over there and take a look. Yep. And he's also been on our podcast. And when uh, Joe told me he had a, a, a article from Chewy there, you know, it's kind of weird because Chewy has so much stuff, uh, so much content um, on uh the internet there i almost feel like he's my instructor <laughs> you know i've learned so much stuff from him <laughs> and it's like man i'm like uh, bowing down to know he he's on here but uh you know i do want to give a shout out to him for all he puts out there and man he's helped me so much um you know through the years never even met the guy but uh um you know guys like him that uh put that content out there it, it's it just allows me to study after hours you know when i'm not uh training it allows me to uh you know find some video he put up and uh and study it yep i think he does a good job of kind of uh putting content out that reaches a really wide audience you know i know a lot of really new guys have stumbled onto his content and they love it uh, but it's also very helpful if you're much further along in your jiu-jitsu career as well so speaking of uh, further along uh, just got a text from Byron. I guess his uh, his procedure's over. Uh, he's back to being asymmetrical, and everything is right in the world. That's awesome. You know, uh, thank you everybody for the the prayers uh, to make sure that Byron came out of this okay. And uh, you know, he's it'll definitely help his confidence. You know, now that he only. Like you said, he's asymmetrical. He's not lactating anymore. He won't have to worry about putting pads on his chest underneath his uh, no-gi attire. And now all we have to do is work on is his arms. You know, it's great being, you know, under sedation because he let us know how he really feels. So, you know, we'll work on his arms, you know, build up his biceps, build up his triceps. And, you know, once we get that taken care of, then maybe we'll work on his web feet. And, um, you know, from that point... The guy's going to be a beast. Well, he already is, but he'll just be more of a beast. Yeah, he may find that uh, positions like spider guard are a little easier to play when your feet, your toes are not all attached to each other. So, Yeah, because it's like Fred Flintstone feet. It's like having a brick for your foot. <laughs> you know, there's nothing. <laughs> uh, you know, I want to give a shout out to our Patreon supporters. Um, Patreon is a website for content producers like ourselves, and it allows uh, you to show support for your favorite uh, content producers. And um, basically what it is is uh, what most of the people do is, is they donate a dollar per show. And uh, if you have any uh, 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 free funds or, you know, you have the means to donate, you know, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, all the money used is to to help the show get better. Um, we also used it to uh, to have the BJJ Brick event, which we had uh, last summer. We brought in uh, Tim Sled and Rolly Delgado. You know, two incredible incredible people who uh, taught taught us and helped us get better. Um, so, if you do have the means, uh, you know. Check out Patreon, and uh, we appreciate all of our Patreon supporters. We appreciate all of our supporters, uh, but thank you very much to our Patreon uh, team, Patreon. Gary, would you say that uh, the activity that we engage in is an athletic activity? Definitely an athletic activity. So are you, um, saying, you, know, that, are you saying that we have a lot of athletic supporters? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Next show is at 10 and a true two drink minimum. <laughs> you took me down that path, Joe, just like jiu-jitsu. You took me down a path. Yep. All right. So in case anybody doesn't know, Byron really never had three nipples. If you've listened to the show more than twice, you understand our humor. Uh, you, pro <laughs> you probably also know that if Byron had a third nipple, he would keep that thing. <laughs> Dude, I know I would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, Byron couldn't be here today. He just had previous engagements and uh, gave Gary and I a stab at doing this one on our own. I think it went well, Gary. 
I think it did. You know, I, 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 you know, can't believe Byron actually, you know, gave us the keys to the recording studio. And, uh, you know, Byron is the, the brains behind this thing. Uh, Joe and I, we like to say we're the brawn, but, um, we're not, we're not very good with curls and the squat rack. So maybe we're not the brawn, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a first, the first BJJ Brick podcast without Byron. I've not been on every one. Joe's not been on every one, but Byron has. So, um, you know, this could be a collector's issue. Um, or maybe we did such a bad job that maybe uh, it'll be one that uh, will be a lost episode. It'll have three downloads. <laughs> <laughs> you, me, and my mom. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, guys, uh, join us next week. Uh, until then, stay sweaty, my friends. And don't forget to shower. And train hard, train smart, and get better. We'll see you on the mats. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs> <laughs>